Hey, how you doing? Welcome to Garden Fork Radio. My name is Eric. I am your host. It's the Eclectic DIY Show. I also have a companion YouTube channel, also called Garden Fork. Today, I wanted to talk to you about cicada broods, very exciting, and jack stands. I love sharing stuff, and I wonder if some of my friends get annoyed that I overshare. Like, I have an article about maple syrup, and there in southern New Jersey, a university is testing the idea of tapping red maples in southern New Jersey. We have sugar maples and red maples in my part of New England. And red maples have a lower sugar point, but could it be a viable business because there's tons of red maples in southern New Jersey? So they have a grant and they're studying that. I'm like, oh, I, my neighbors in Connecticut do maple syrup. Would they be interested in that? Or is it, oh, oh, geez, it's Eric with another article he wants to share. So um, we're not going to share that article today. <laughs> a side note here, had kind of a, um, I, I, a failure of internet while Nicole and I were recording the show this morning. And um, I learned that I cannot record a podcast while the camera operator is working from home and doing a video Zoom call. We just don't have the data rate, I think, the bandwidth, I guess is the word, for both of us to be using recording equipment. And uh, I haven't told Nicole this yet, but it was, the whole thing failed. It just wouldn't, it, it, uh, it failed to upload my end of the conversation. Her end of the conversation was perfect. Anyway, I found two articles I wanted to share with you. One, I was talking with one of my best friend, Matt, who I went to college with. We went to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And we and we started to talk about cicadas, which some people call locusts. I don't know if they're part of the locust family. Um, that I'm going to get in trouble for, so I'm going to stay away from that. But I distinctly remember being in Carbondale during one of the uh, cicada blooms, they are called or cicada broods. And this year, 2024, we have a double cicada broom emergence, the 13 year and 17 year cicadas, which means they're in the ground for 17 years. Um, the females lay eggs in a slice of the twig, then they migrate down into the ground and they're in a pupa stage for that long, which is pretty wild. <laughs> And then they come out and it's a massive number of cicadas. There are uh, cicada broods along the east, not quite the seaboard, actually it's along the Appalachians and into Ohio up to um, Lake Erie, I believe that is there. And also uh, there's a cicada bloom going along the Mississippi and out through Missouri into Kansas as well. Those are other broods. The 17 year and the 13-year cicadas overlap in, New, in not New Jersey, in Illinois. Uh, the 17 years around Chicago and central Illinois, the 13-year brood is more in southern Illinois and western Illinois, and also kind of along the southern tier of the Appalachians into Alabama, if you can imagine that curve there. Uh, there's this really great article in Scientific American and I, because I was talking to my buddy and we looked it up while we were talking to each other on the phone and it's pretty cool. So there's a great quote here that I wanted to read to you. There's just a massive number of cicadas and then there are several cicada predators. I believe one is a wasp that eats the back of the animal out. <laughs> and there's a great quote here from Mary Weiss, who's an insect ecologist at Georgetown University. The whole point of the gigantic co-emergence is that they are synchronously coming out and satiating their predators, says Martha Weiss, insect ecologist. Because cicadas are hyperabundant and they're entirely undefended, they are not poisonous, they are not spiny, they're entirely palatable, I don't know about that. They are slow flyers. They really are just sitting ducks. Their defense is coming out in the billions, she adds. Predators really can't just possibly eat all of them. 
But predators sure can eat a lot of them, and they benefit tremendously from the sudden cicada banquet. Birds are particularly fond of munching on cicadas, but a range of animals, reptiles, and even fish snack on the insects as well. Birds eat so many cicadas that their usual prey, left mostly untouched, can flourish, Lil says, so much so that during emergence years, trees can suffer from higher than usual damage by caterpillars and other insects that the birds usually keep under control. And female cicadas also damage trees directly by slicing into twigs to lay their eggs. Although these two types of damage rarely kill trees, the effect is enough to reset the clocks of trees such as oaks, which typically undergo mast years. I don't know if you ever talked about mast with your friends, like uh, people that go deer hunting or turkey hunting, in which, okay, they typically undergo mast years in which they produce large batches of acorns every few years in synchrony. After accumulating dirt damage during the cicada emergence, these trees produce lean harvests for two autumns in a row and then feast like bursts of nuts two and a half years after cicada emergence, Lil says. Oh, Lil is another uh, educator that is quoted farther up here. So let me scroll up. By the way, do you hear a dripping noise? We're getting two days of rain here. I am in my kitchen in Brooklyn and... Um, I just kind of put the microphone on my kitchen table here and off the back of the building, the water that's coming down hits the mini split um, coolant lines, which are in a plastic covering. And then they drop onto the bulkhead, which is the, the metal thing that covers the entrance to the, so that's making a tapping noise. And I have a cardoid microphone that's supposed to take more volume from me and not from behind it, which is where the noise is going. Oh, here we go. John Lill is an insect ecologist at George Washington University. I just want to read a little bit more of this because I, I think it's I think it's neat. So late spring and early summer and forests of eastern half of the US have been eerily quiet for the past two years. In most years, long lived periodical cicadas thrum through the region. But a quirk of timing means these insects have been sparse since 2021. This year, though, they're roaring back. That's because 2024 will see two separate batches of periodical cicadas emerge en masse, spread across much of the eastern half of the U.S. These insects crawl out of the ground once every 13 to 17 years for a rush of mating and egg laying until all the adults die, and the next generation is tucked underground until their own teenage years. It's an unusual but but ancient life cycle that has become part of the fabric of Eastern U.S. US forests. Sorry. So yeah, we learned about that with the mast, how the cicadas affect the oaks, and then two and a half years later, the oaks put out like a double bloom of acorns. This will be on full display this spring when both a 13-year brood and a 17-year brood emerging across adjoining territories is a particularly rare occurrence. They don't often coincide in time, but to have them coincide in time and space is even more unusual, says John Lill, insect ecologist at George Washington University. That's what's happening this year. That's generating a lot of buzz, pun intended. So I just, I think this is very cool. I've been uh, in several cicada brood hatches, I guess. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's nature. And I've noticed most of the cicadas come out of lawn, lawns. Instead of forests, they're, they're more abundant in lawns. I don't know, because the oaks are in people's front yards or something. In college... It was right. They would. They were coming out near the, well, just one of the big parts of campus. That's a bunch of grass, you know, between the buildings here. But that was crazy. And then in Brooklyn here, we have had them as well because I had a friend who made a art installation out of dead cicada carcasses. Is that for a lack of a better word? The uh, exoskeleton of the cicada. I think that is. I just want to follow up by the last of the article. 
the relationship, in other words, the relationship between cicadas and the forest underscores how periodical cicadas have shaped the forest they live in despite spending most of their time underground, Lil says. Periodical cicadas were here long before people were, he says. They have a really strange life cycle, but they're an intrinsic part of the forest ecosystems that have been here for millions of years. In other words, before us and most likely after us. And it will be an unusually long time before two cicada broods emerge simultaneously again, not until 2037, when the 13-year brood uh, XIX cicadas born this year and the 17-year brood IX of North Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia both make an appearance. Those are Roman numerals. The delay makes this year's cicada circus a spectacle not to be missed. Kids will remember this for their lifetime. Maybe they will remember it for being disgusting and loud, but also, in a way, it's magical. Cool, huh? So I am going to link to this. It is Scientific American, which is like science-based. If you want to read it, it's the March 11, 2024, A Double Emergence of Periodic Cicada. A double emergence of periodical cicadas isn't cicada geddon. It's a marvel is the headline there. So yeah, I'll do it in the show notes, but also you could literally go to the the um, the Firefox or the DuckDuckGo or Google if you want to do that and type in periodical cicada scientificamerican.com and the article should show up or it'll be in the show notes here. Hey, real quick here. I was wondering if you wanted to join the Garden Fork email list. It's uh, it's Maura Eric. I don't know if you want that or not. Um, but the best way to do that, if you go to the GardenFork.tv site, there are signups all over the place. There should be one on every page. Also, in the show notes for this show, if you're listening to it in the iTunes app or one of the other podcast app, to click on the little, I think you click on the little text thumbnail of the show and the notes will pop up and there's a link in there uh, or just go to gardenfork.tv and there should be a sign up there all right thank you okay i just turned off the refrigerator <laughs> and then i put a note in the counter that says fridge i have other times when i'm recording the uh, DIY nature of the podcast, I have forgotten to turn the fridge back on and then I realized the next day. I mean, you can you can get away with it, but um, it's something to avoid, <laughs> aspirationally to avoid. There's a site called uh, Jalopnik that I read. It's part of the Gizmodo um, empire. I don't know if that lack of a better word, but um, they have a section called Wrenching. I, you know, I learned about some electric cars this way and the site has kind of taken a hit as far as what I think is quality, but, um, it's still some, still some readable stuff here. And there was an article about jack stands. If, if you're not familiar with jack stands, they are basically, if you want to jack your car up and work underneath it, you, you jack it up with your floor jack or your, you know, your car jack, and then you put jack stands underneath in predetermined places, ideally under the axles. There is, um, if you look up any car, there will be places the manufacturer suggests to place jack stands or things like that. And then you lower the jack, uh, so you lower the vehicle onto the jack stands. The jack stands are taking the weight, and then the jack itself, which is like usually a floor jack, is not taking the weight. But some jack stands can be a little dodgy. So there is an article here. It's called, uh, I'll just say, Junkie Jack Stands Can Kill You, But Which Ones Are Safe? A video from Project Farm YouTube channel with its typical blend of redneck engineering and actual science helps answer that question. And the video is really good. I will link to it. Um, I'll just kind of sum up the article here. And everyone who has worked on their own car has likely heard approximately one million times that you should never get underneath a vehicle that is only supported by a hydraulic jack and that it's only safe once a vehicle is resting securely on jack stands. 
But what if your jack stands aren't good? I'm paraphrasing some of the words used here, uh, putting in more family-friendly words here. Given how relatively simple jack stands are and the fact that they have to do one job or one job only, you'd think that they're more or less all equally created. They're all created equally. They're not. Designs and quality vary greatly, and sometimes cheaping out on these simple safety devices is a real bad idea. For example, remember back in 2020 when the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration had to issue a recall for Harbor Freight's six-ton Pittsburgh jack stands. Uh, so it goes on, uh, you know, talking about, they're usually fairly short articles, but I thought some very interesting uh, comments were made in the comments section. The, the, some of the, the, some of the article is that $90, a $90 set of Husky jack stands from Home Depot seem to be a good move. But more importantly, make sure you lift your vehicle on a stable level surface and don't get in a situation where there's a significant side load on the vehicle that could easily cause the jack to the jack stand itself to tip. Like if you're up on jack stands and someone opens one of the doors and tries to sit in the front one of the seats, you know, because you're putting weight slightly on one side, that would be bad. Or um, if you're like lifting an engine out and the engine tilts and knocks the side of the firewall or something, that can also happen. What, what, I, what I do with the jack stands is I will jack up my car. I usually only jack up the front or the back. And it's usually the front because I'm replacing the, the, the disc brake pads. The front, your front brakes will always wear out faster than your rear brakes do because they're taking most of the weight when you're braking. And it's, it's one of the last things you can work on on your car, I'm thinking. There's so much, so much computery stuff you have to do. And the brakes are fairly analog still, which is nice. I think even on our Volkswagen ID4, they're pretty straightforward. But what I do is I jack up the front, I put the jack stands, I have heavy duty, high quality jacks. I don't know who made them, but they are they are very well built. And um, I put them underneath the, it's called the lower A-frame of the front wheels. So that is where the suspension of each individual front wheel may match connects to your the frame of the car and around there is usually a place that you can slide in your jack stands and hold the weight of the front end you want to be careful not to put it so it's pinching a pipe or something or wires and then i let the jack down and you can you can hear when the weight sits on the jack stands but then I don't lower the jack all the way to the ground, like I'm gonna go put the jack away. I just lower it maybe a quarter inch off the frame, and then I lock the um, floor jack in that position, and I leave it there. So if, you know, God forbid some reason, like a hurricane comes and blows the car one way, or the jack stands fail for some reason, which I don't see doing with the pair that I have, the jack w might take the weight or it might at least serve as a giant chunk of metal that the car falls on and your head isn't crushed or isn't crushed completely. <laughs> I mean, it's all about, again, about common sense. What I learned this time is that the a lot of guys, a lot, sorry, a lot of people they take the tires off when they take the tires off a car to work on the brakes or something. They slide those under the car as well at a point where it's pretty obvious if they were, if the car were to fall at the jack stands, that the tires would at least leave you with eight inches under the car to get yourself out of there, you know? And um, basically, I know it isn't, pre one of these guys' names is Panther Cougar. I know it isn't practical to do all the time, but I almost always lower the car onto jack stands, then raise the jack back up where it's slightly engaged. I don't do that. I figure it's an additional fail safe. Um, but another, gen another person here, Tim the Ninja, I also put 
the wheels that I've taken off under the car. So yeah. And it, of course, with any article that allows comments and there are people that do it, it's there's 70 comments about this here. And there's like a deep dive. Um, what I've also done is I have scrap pieces of like six by six or eight by eight pressure treated lumber from a deck project or a project of a friend. And I'll slide those underneath too. I have them stacked on a shelf in the garage. And in addition to the jack stand, I'll take those and I'll double them up. So that you've got what, 12 inches or 16 inches or something. And if the car drops onto those, the, the car ain't the car ain't falling on you. I mean, it might it's gonna bang up the frame of the car, but uh oh, Spiker has just shown up here. Spiker's doing pretty good since her surgery. Hi, little girl. Hi. She has brought her um, marrow bone and is very exciting. And the the tail is thumping me now. What are you doing? Hi. Hi. Uh, you probably saw her in the last vid. They just, um, they love to kind of come over and see what I'm doing. So she has just parked herself. Did you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. You do have to be careful about your floor jack though. You get what you pay for. Uh, again, here there's an argument about whether Harbor Freight, the Harbor Freight jacks are made by the same company that makes like snap-on jacks, which is a very high quality tool people, people high quality tool company i mean i don't know like i you know i have a, a chainsaw that's quite expensive and they're like oh it's a, that's you know the cheap ones are just made at the same place and i'm like well i don't i don't know but you do i think you get what you pay for with uh floor jacks so just pay attention to that if you're not buying from a um a quality manufacturer uh one person says a three-ton jack from the inexpensive tool store has a much higher chance of failing than a three-ton high-end jack because everything at the inexpensive tool store is built as cheaply as possible, which means in general, it's not built to last. And uh, someone also says, go to Costco when they have Arcan brand, A-R-C-A-N jacks, in other words, Arcan floor jacks, and get one of those. You'll get decades of solid performance out of it. I never worry about the jack failing, even though, yes, I do support everything with jack tails. Yeah, I did not know that. Um, I go to the Costco in Brooklyn, so they don't um, they don't sell floor jacks there. They do sell car batteries there, which is interesting, and wiper blades. It is a good place to pick up uh, wiper blades, by the way. If you have a new car that is a hybrid or... Um, has the uh, the quality, I don't know, whatever. when you stop at a stop sign, if the engine turns off, you need a different battery. You can't just get a regular battery and put it in there because the battery actually is drawn on a lot more at, at where cars that turn off at the uh, stop sign or the red light to save on some, uh, some pollution, some emissions there. So yeah, just two things I wanted to share with you. Um, we will be by, I hope I have Nicole back. I'm working on some new guests as well. And yeah, it's always fun to hear from you. So it's radio at gardenfork.tv, radio at gardenfork.tv. Tell you my, tell you my, tell me your cicada story and your floor jack opinions. I would love to hear from them. It's raining more now and it's lightning as well. And I'm going to remember to turn on the refrigerator. How's that for deep thought? I'll see you. Garden Fork Radio is produced by Garden Fork Media LLC in Brooklyn, New York. Our executive producer is Jimmy Goose. For more information about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes, visit hollowbooks.com. The music in the show is licensed from audioblocks.com and uniquetracks.com. Music